My uh, first question is, what was your childhood like back in the 80s? Childhood in the 80s, I loved it. I loved it. My only regret is that I'm, I wasn't older. But, you know, I had a great time. I grew up in the suburbs outside of New York City. And it was a great time. I mean, we got into music really, really young. When we moved to our second house in New York, we got cable. And I found MTV, and that was 1983. So at that point, you know, just about everything they played was at least tolerable, if not good. And they were playing all kinds of crazy stuff. Year, a couple of years back, I started collecting bootleg DVDs of just, you know, people would put their tape in the VCR and just tape hours of MTV. So I started getting these DVDs, and they were playing crazy stuff, man, like Tigers of Tantang, Vendetta, Riot, all those kinds of bands. They were playing them on MTV back then, and I know I must have seen that stuff when I was young because that's all I would do. Before I was in school, the babysitter would come over in the morning, and we would sit and watch it all day long. So I know I saw all that stuff when I was a kid because it was only, I got into metal when I was like eight or nine years old and I think that explains exactly why I did, you know? Uh, uh, what kind of a metal genre are you in, are you into? I'm into really all old school metal, all old school. There's really nothing that's off limits. I don't really care for hair metal too much if it gets too light, but I'll listen to, you know, old Motley Crue, I'll listen to Rat, I'll listen to stuff like that. My favorite styles are the New Wave of British Heavy Metal, and even the bands surrounding that from that same time period that weren't necessarily British, like American bands like Riot and The Rod, and, you know, like European bands like Accept and Cuddy Sark and things like that. And then I also like the uh, first wave of death metal, which was basically, you know, coming out of the thrash metal with, like, early Metallica and Slayer and all that, but just pushed to that next level band, like, to death and Massacre, and Deceased, and things like that. Uh, well, the, my favorite kind of metal is, like, the same kind of, the same kind, is, which is yours, which is the Wobblem, uh, music like Riot, and... Yep. The one thing that I'm not really into, but it's popular, that it's popular today is, um, Glam, and, uh, then... That new rap metal crap. Oh, I can't stand that. See, that that hit when I was in high school. That hit my freshman year of high school, and I ended up getting into punk rock for a couple of years because I didn't really know about a lot of the old school metal bands back then, and I didn't really have anybody to show me what was good and what wasn't. And you know, I already liked like the Misfits and the Ramones and some bands like that. Yeah, I ended up getting into punk in the mid '90s till I was about 19 just because I couldn't believe what had happened to metal at that point. I was just like, that's metal, they can have it, you know? Well, I got into metal thanks to my dad's records that you saw on Facebook. Oh, yeah, it was very nice. <laughs> so, my next, my next one is, um, what was your uh, very first, what was your very first band that you've been in? My first band was when I was in junior high school. It was 1994. I had been into the big early 90s death metal scene for a couple of years. Since I was about 11 or 12, I'd been to bands like Obituary and Cannibal Corpse and Old Sepultura before they started before they started doing that rap metal shit. You know, they used to be like straight death metal bands like that. And then from there, that was sort of the end of days for the whole underground tape trading demo scene. But I was able to get into that for the last couple of years that that was around before the internet took off. So I started writing the bands and getting demo tapes and doing that. And, you know, I was so young, I knew there was no, you know, no chance that I could have a band that could like play a lot of shows and travel and do all that kind of stuff. But this underground demo scene seemed like a totally different world where you could get your band out there and heard without having to do all that. So some friends and I from school, we started our own death metal band called Aneurysm. And we were pretty horrible. We couldn't play. We, you know, we barely knew how to play. We, we just, you know, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. And my voice hadn't changed yet. And there I am up there trying to do raging death metal vocals with a voice that, you know, was like a 12-year-old, 13-year-old voice. So you can imagine what that was like. But, you know, but it was fun, man, because, you know, the people, the bands that I was in contact with that I was in the tapes out doing stuff, they were very supportive because they couldn't believe kids so young were doing it. And there was one, there used to be a real good death metal scene in my area back then. There was tons of bands, but there was one band that went to the high school. They were only a few years older than us called Inebriation. 
and they ended up giving us a hand a little bit. We got to play a few shows with them. Uh, what was it? What was it like back in back in those days? Was it uh, really fun? Oh yeah, it was exciting. It was so fun. I was you know I was in seventh grade, eighth grade. I didn't have like any real issues. You know, I mean, school was school. I mean, I kind of screwed up in school and didn't really do much, but. My whole life was, you know, metal music, death metal at that point. That's all I would do. I would just, you know, I'd write to the bands, get the demos, get the fanzines, whatever. Then when i get my allowance, I would go to the record stores, buy as many albums as I possibly could. I mean, my whole life centered around that. And, you know, I wasn't really able to go to see a lot of bands because when the big bands like Cannibal Corpse and stuff would come through, the shows would always be 18 and over. But every once in a while, a lot of the local death metal bands would play like an all-ages matinee show on a weekend afternoon on a Saturday or Sunday, and I get to go to those shows. So at least there was that, you know. But yeah, it was a great time. I loved it. Uh, I have listened to uh, some of the demos back in uh, in uh, in MySpace, and I I had to admit some of them were some of them didn't really sound really good and. Some of them sound really, uh, really cool. Just... Yeah. How are you talking about Sacrificial Blood? Are you talking about my old band, Aneurysm? Uh, <laughs> I heard that you were in another in another band called... Uh, ASD, the hardcore band. Yeah, that was uh, that was me and the old bass player from Sacrificial Blood, Ian. He, uh, he's still playing with them now, but I'm not. I, I quit that band in 2007, and, he, and he's playing with them now. And, you know, they they took off, and they're doing very, very well on the East Coast. They're playing all the time, and they just put out a record. They got a lot of stuff going on. So that's why we bought somebody new into Sacrificial Blood, because, you know, he had to go and do that. I couldn't hold him back from that, you know. Oh. Is there any other bands that you were on before uh, Sacrificial Blood? Oh, yeah, I've been in tons of bands. When I got into the punk scene, I played in a ton of bands in the punk scene for about three or four years. I had a band called Society's Failure back then. And that got, we, we released our own 7-inch 45 record, and we got to play in New York City a lot with bands like The Casualties and Blank 77 and all the big punk bands that were around in the late 90s. And then uh, it, in Center Visual Blood, I was in, I was in ASD for a couple of years, and just up until a couple months ago, I played for a year with... Uh, I, I had actually resurrected an old New Jersey band from the early 90s that was called Grim Legion. They were one of the death metal bands from back in the old days. And I had made some YouTube videos of some of their songs from back then, and they ended up finding them, and they got in touch with me, and we started jamming, and we did a bunch of shows, and we recorded an album and all this. But it just didn't stay together, unfortunately. I had to bail. And I don't know. I, I think they're looking for another drummer, but I don't exactly know what they're going to do. Uh what uh, what instrument did you uh did you play on? Um, I heard in the very first band that you played, and you played uh bass and the vocals, and then in in second yeah, I did bass and vocals in my first band, Aneurysm. In two of the punk bands I was in, I played drums or three of them rather. I'm sorry, yeah, three of the punk bands I was in, I played drums. Society's Failure, I was just the lead singer. Then after Society Failure broke up, and before I started Sacrificial Blood, there was two or three years there where I was just jamming with anybody, and sometimes I would play drums, sometimes I would sing, pretty much whatever the situation called for was what I would do, you know? Oh. And, uh, since when did you, uh, quit doing the bass? I haven't really played it since that first band of mine, not seriously, you know? I just did it at that time because I had been taking lessons on it for a year, and the thing with the early 90s death metal scene was that those bands did those crazy, crazy blast beats that were super fast. Like, I was never able to play those, and I still can't do that now. As you know, Sacrificial Blood it comes from more of like a thrash metal, speed metal kind of school rather than straight death metal. But yeah, I could never do that style. That's why I didn't play drums and aneurysm, is because I wanted it to be like those crazy fast bands from back in those days. But yeah, I haven't played the bass since those days, not, not seriously. Oh, and uh, since when did you got into the drums? Drums was the first instrument I ever played. I started taking lessons till I was nine, and I stopped when I was about fourteen. 
And like I said, you know, here and there I'd play in bands over the years. When Sire Visual Flood started, I just couldn't find a drummer. So I was like, well, because I wanted to be the singer. I didn't want to be the drummer, but it just kind of happened that way. So we never found the right drummer, so I've just been doing it all this time. Uh, how did you... Uh... How did you handle by being the uh, the drummer and the vocalist at the same time? For the first year, we didn't play any shows at all. We would just practice instrumentally. And then when we would record our demos, I would do the vocals then. And then, I don't know, we started getting show offers, and I just kind of had to force myself to do it. And, you know, we spent a couple months practicing really, really hard before our first show so I could get it all down, and then from there I was good to go. It's just if you, you know, it's like anything else you practice that you'll get it, you know. Ah, uh, nice. Um, what was the, uh, the story of your, uh, the train wreck that you had that I had, uh, heard about on Facebook? Oh, back in those days, I was into a lot of drugs and alcohol and partying and going crazy, so my life was a train wreck, you know? <laughs> You know, I was always, you know, just getting messed up and raising hell and being ridiculous, you know. <laughs> why, uh, why death metal? Why death metal? I've been, you know, it was the first, you know, I liked, I liked music before that, but that was the first real thing that I really got into where it was my whole life. It was everything about me. It was, you know, it just meant so much to me when I was young and it's just always stuck with me. I stopped, I really stopped following metal, modern metal that is. I really stopped following modern metal in the early 90s when I got into punk. I haven't really stayed up on it since then. You know, the bands I like are all old ones. I just find out about more old bands now rather than trying to see what's popular nowadays or what the scene is into nowadays. But death metal from back then, the old death metal is, you know, always going to be some of my most favorite music. It's probably shaped, you know, my tastes and my interests and things, you know, that was really the, the lightning rod where, like I said, it became my whole life. It was the first kind of music I ever played, you know, it was the first kind of music where I just got totally into it, you know, wanted to know everything I could about it was just, it was, it was, it was everything to me when I was young, so it just stuck. Uh, how did you, uh, how did you express heavy metal? Like, uh, headbanging, doing a mosh pit and all that? I used to mosh and slam dance and stage dive when I was younger, but I injured my knee really bad when I was about 23. But I still get up there. I'll still headbang. You know, when I go see my favorite bands, I'll jump up on stage with them and sing along and stuff like that. I don't do the full slam dancing and all that anymore. But, yeah, I still rock out when I go to a show, always. Well, how I... Well, I... I, I express metal by uh, headbanging, sing singing along and I I'm not allowed to go into mosh pits because um little fact about me is that I'm autistic. Oh, uh, yeah. When I get to a mosh pit I would die immediately. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. So uh I just uh I just headbang, sing along and then So yeah, that's how that's how I did it. Yeah, that's how I do it. It's, you know, yeah, I mean I suppose moshing is fine for people who want to mosh, but it's just not my scene anymore. I'm too old. <laughs> Okay. How did all right? How did uh, sacrificial blood got started? I had had the idea in my head for a, for a year or two before I started the band. Like I told you, in the years after my punk bands broke up, before I started sacrificial blood, I was doing lots of different projects with lots of different people, but it wasn't necessarily music I liked. It was just friends of mine and people I knew that needed me to sit in or needed, you know, a drummer or somebody to fill in for him. It wasn't anything that I was really enjoying too much. At that time, when I got out of punk rock, like I said, I went straight back to metal, nothing but old school metal. That's all I was listening to. And I wanted to have a band that was sort of along the lines of Venom or Possessed or like, you know, the first three Slayer albums on Metal Blade Records when they were real, you know, wild and sick and really crazy compared to what they became later. But I wanted to have a band like that. And I didn't, you know, nobody around here at that time was listening to that kind of stuff. Everybody around here at that time, if they were into any kind of metal, they were into, like, Pantera and Corn and System of a Down and all that kind of shit. I didn't like that at all. Uh. And so I had songs written. I had Sagar Visual Blood, the band name. I had a logo designed. I had all this great stuff ready to roll, and I didn't know anybody. 
So I met the first guitarist, Pete. He lived across the street from a friend of mine's uncle who was way into heavy metal. And we'd go over there and, you know, drink beers with him and hang out and listen to records and stuff. We went over there one day. The uncle wasn't home. Pete was coming home from school. He was wearing a leather jacket. He had an old school Metallica Master of Puppets t-shirt on. And, you know, I hadn't seen anybody like that in this area since I was, since I was like a little kid. So we went up in his room, we started hanging out, we had a couple of beers, and we were put, putting on some music and hanging out, and it turned out he played guitar, so I said, let's start a band. So we started, you know, he and I got together. The, ba- the bass player from my old punk band, he's a very good friend of mine named Jude, was the first one. He just came into Sacrifice of the Blood with me, because we had been playing music for years and years together at that point. And then the last kid was the second guitar player in that first lineup. His name was Chase. He was just a kid that we knew from the neighborhood. He wasn't really into, like, old-school metal like we were, but he was a friend of ours, and he said that we could practice at his house. So he joined the band, and, yeah, we just practiced at his house. We did that first demo. And then that lineup broke up. And I already met a couple other guys that I knew were going to be better for the band than those guys were. So me and Pete stayed together. We got Ian, who's in ASD, as I said earlier. And we got another guitarist named Ross. We did another demo. We played two shows with that lineup, then that one broke up. Then me, Ian, and Pete just stayed together as a three-piece. We started playing shows in New York. We started playing shows in Philly. I There, there was an independent label from Virginia called Rusty Axe Records back then that had bought the demos from me and wanted to do a release for us. So they started doing a couple, they did a couple releases for us. They did uh, a cassette that had us on one side and a band called Demonic Mortuary on the other side. They did a CD that had us and a band called Zombie from California who actually became that band Warbringer that's very, very popular now. They tour with like Exodus and stuff like that. And then after that CD, well, when we recorded that CD, we got interest from another record label called Heavy Artillery Records. That's actually a pretty big label. They, they like, send their bands over to Europe and put them on tour and stuff. We signed the contract. We sent it in. Pete disappeared. He wouldn't answer his phone. I'd go by his house. His parents would say he wasn't home. Couldn't find him. Couldn't find him. Couldn't find him. We ended up losing the record deal. I ended up tracking him down, like, six months later. And I just told him, like, man, you completely, you know, stabbed us in the back and you ruined our shot. And I was like, you're out of the band. I didn't even have anybody that I could replace him with. I was like, that's it for you. You're done. Then we had been playing in Philly for a year, for about a year and a half at that point, And we met a lot of people down there and established a lot of contacts. And there was a guy I know, he was, he was in a death metal band called The Crucifier. His name was Spencer. He was a good friend of mine. He ended up joining the band after we kicked Pete out. He was the guitar player. And then we did two more seven inches. We did a split with a band from Philly called Trasher that we were very good friends with. And we did a split seven inch with the 80s death metal band Deceased, which was a big moment for me because that's like one of my all time favorite bands. And when those records came out, we got another second guitarist. His name is Kevin Maul. We call him Arnie. That's his nickname. That's who's still playing in Sacrificial Blood now. And the four of us did that for a while until we broke up the first time in 2009. After that, I moved out to Seattle, Washington for a year. I had some stuff out there I had to do. I ended up recording a bunch of songs with the guitarist from the 80s, uh, thrash metal band Postmortem. So that was cool. But I came back in the summer of 2010, and that's when we recorded the full-length album, the one I sent to you. Uh-huh. Then I ended up, I went back to Seattle for another two months and ended up moving back to New Jersey. And when I got back to New Jersey, me, Ian, and Arnie decided we wanted to do Sacrificial Blood again, so we got back together. But Ian, at that point, was also playing with ASD, and like I said, they started doing very, very well, got very, very popular, so I kind of had to let them go do that because I didn't want to ruin their shot, you know? Yeah. And we got another bassist named Brian. His nickname is Lumberjack. He stayed with us until just this past September, and then in September we got a brand new bassist who's a friend of ours named Evan. He was in a band called Savage Skull from New York a couple of years ago who were very, very good. Yeah, sorry to go on at length there, but I figured I'd give you the whole story about all the members. <laughs> it just takes a lot to, uh, to, uh, to, keep, in, to keep in track of the, uh, of the members. It's kind of like 
it's kind of like Riot if you're if you uh, talk about Mark Reale's uh, story. Oh yeah, the joke the joke that's been amongst me and my friends for years now. We call sacrificial blood Mike Keller's rainbow because you know how much Richie Blackmore's rainbow changes the lineup. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Sacrificial blood is Mike Keller's rainbow, you know. I would like to, uh, I would like to to ask one of my uh, favorite songs of the full length album is a song called Revenge. Yep. And um, what was the what was the story behind that? Story behind that song. It's it's a pretty much universal song. Everyone's been, you know, double-crossed. Everyone's been stabbed in the back. Everybody's been, you know, let down by somebody. You know, everybody's been let down by somebody. And when that happens to me, it makes me very, very angry. I don't like the way it makes me feel at all, you know. And that song was basically a venting of the way I was feeling. I just got out of a very, very bad relationship, actually. <laughs> And the girl had cheated on me a bunch of times and all kinds of crazy stuff, so I was just not a happy person at all. And that song just sort of focused all that rage into a song, you know. Uh, how did you, uh, how did you came up with the name Sacrificial Blood? It's just, you know, it's one of those things, I don't think I thought too hard about it at the time. There's a book called Lords of Chaos that was about the whole underground uh, death metal, black metal scene in Norway back in the 90s when all those crazy bands were murdering people and burning the churches and all that. But in that book, they talk about there was a fanzine that somebody did called Sacrificial Blood. And I read that book about a thousand times, but I don't think I saw the name in there and thought that's a good name for a band. One of the theories is that, you know, two of my favorite bands, and especially at the time when I was starting the band, was a Canadian thrash metal band called Sacrifice, and then there was a New Jersey thrash metal band called Blood Feast that I liked a lot. Maybe it was the combination of those two bands, because those were two of the main bands that we were listening to when we started the band. You know, who knows? I really can't tell you. It just sounded, you know, it just popped in my head and it sounded like it was a good name, you know? Uh, nice. Now, going into a little bit, just going into more about the album, um, who uh, who created the uh, the artwork, the art cover of the? The artwork is by an artist named Seth Bennett. He was from Virginia originally. I think he lives in North Carolina, South Carolina now. He's done a ton of work for a lot of underground death metal and black metal bands. He's actually got a little bit of a name for himself in the underground scene. Ah. Uh, and uh, what about what about the title? Unholy fucking hatred. It's just uh. It's actually, it's the second verse in Sacrificial Blood, the song goes, Unholy Fucking Hatred, Insane Rampage of Death. So I took it from there, and I think it sums up the sound of the band. I think, it, you know, it gives you a good, if you look at the album cover, you see the title, you know what you're buying. There's no, there's no, nothing like, gee, I wonder what these guys sound like. You know, it's right there. You know right away what you're getting when you see that, you know. It's right, it's just right at your face. Exactly. It's direct, it's to the point, it's fist in your face, you know, metal up your ass, all that kind of, you know, all that great, you know, that's something that I think a lot of today's metal doesn't have. All those bands back in the 80s had a great, you know, fuck you kind of attitude that you really don't get in too many bands no more, you know, it's just not like that no more. Uh, how, how did the, uh, the album got it, got it started? Oh, well, yeah, you know, it was, you know, we had done, like I said, we had done a lot of splits, we had done a couple demos, we had done so much, I mean, we had been around eight years before we did that album, so that album was basically like a greatest hits, you know, of everything we had done in the past, it was all new recordings, it wasn't, you know, old stuff that we put back out there, it was all fresh recordings, and it was just, you know, sort of the best songs that we had from all those years we had been playing, you know. Uh and uh, I heard that you were in another band called uh, Grim Grim Legion. Yep. Um, tell me, tell me about that. I mentioned it earlier. They were they were a band who was around this area back in the late '80s, early '90s. Like I said, back in my junior high death metal glory days, they were just one of the local bands that were around back then, and. Two, a year and a half ago, I had made some YouTube videos of some of their old songs from their old demo tapes from 1990 or whatever it was. 
and the band members actually ended up finding them on the internet, and they emailed me thanking me for making the, the videos, and surprisingly, they even knew who Sacrificial Blood was. That kind of blew my mind. You know, I was kind of impressed by that. So I started, I started talking to the singer. His name was Karma, and he was a very cool guy. I started talking to him. And I was like, hey, man, let's get Grim Legion back together. I was like, you know, Sacrificial Blood's got a little bit of a position in the metal scene, so we can go out and do some shows and do some cool stuff. So we did. I played with them for about a year. I had to quit in September. I ended up quitting Grim Legion just because it just, I just didn't have the time to do it. You know, Sacrificial Blood is pretty much my life. I can't, you know, I'm doing, I do other projects, but it can't get in the way of what Sacrificial Blood is doing. As long as it can ride shotgun to Sacrificial Blood, it'll be all good. But Grim Legion, just I just couldn't devote the kind of time that I needed to. So would you say that it's kind of, uh, kind of hard to, to be in two bands at the same time? If you're going to be in two serious bands, yes, I think it's next to impossible. That's the reason that I had to let Ian go, you know, go do the thing with ASD and he couldn't be with Sacrificial Blood anymore because it just became, it became too much. And it, you know, I'm not going to stand in anybody's way, you know. If I joined a band that took off and became very popular, I might go do that for a little while and put Sacrificial Blood on hold. If one of the other members, you know, gets in a band, my guitarist Arnie is in a band, you know, he's down near Philly, he doesn't really live near me, but he has another band down that way, a death metal band called Casket, and they do very, very well. They're very popular down there. And was it earlier this year, actually, he had to take a couple months off to do a bunch of stuff with them, and so I got a friend of mine to fill in and play guitar for a couple of months while he did that. But Ian's other band, ASD, did very, very popular. They're doing very popular right now. They're doing very good. So, you know, you you know, you, you got to go do that. But no, being in two serious bands is very difficult. It's very hard. But, you know, you can, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't do other projects. It's just, I just personally feel that you should have one serious band. That should be the one thing you're doing, and everything else kind of rides shotgun with that. What is the uh, the progress on uh, Sacrificial Blood right now? Well, we're doing very well right now. We just played Baltimore, Maryland last weekend. It was a very good show. We played, where have we played? The past few months we played in Baltimore, we played in Philly, we played in New Jersey, and we played in New York. That's all since September, since that new guy joined. So in the past two months we've done all that. And that's been going very good. And we're taking a break now. We're doing one show in New York City in January, but mainly we're going to start writing the next record and try to get that recorded by about March or April. Is uh, the new song, Souls uh, for Sale, is going to be in that next record? Yes, that's actually the title of the next album, too. Uh, I heard I heard that the, that you have been, uh, that you had sold out the, uh, the very first album, but then you, uh, Send it to uh, to Mexico to make some more. Yeah, the original label that put it out was a German label from Germany called Witches Brew. They actually went out of business right after the record came out. They just you know went under. So they had sent they had sent me two hundred copies, about two hundred two hundred and fifty copies of the album. I think they pressed up eight hundred. They sent me two hundred of them, and I sold out of those. I tried to get in touch with them to see if I could get some more copies, but I, it's been months. I haven't heard back from them. A label from Mexico that's called Iron Blood Death Corps got in touch with me, and they asked if they could release it again, put it back out, and it's going to have some bonus tracks on it and stuff like that, so it should be all right. Cool. Um, are you thinking to, to release it in, more, in, a, in a different format other than a PD? Like, um... I would like to do vinyl again, but that's not really up to me. Actually, last night a guy from New York contacted me, and he's going to do a cassette tape. It's going to be a compilation of all the demo tapes and all of our songs from the split releases from the old days. He's going to put all that stuff out on one cassette. I would love to do more vinyl. Like I said, we did two seven-inch records a couple of years ago. I would love to do more vinyl, but that would be up to a record label to you know contact me and want to put that out. I cannot afford to press a vinyl record on my own, you know. Well, if you ever, well, if you ever got in, if you ever got the money or the time to put it on a vinyl, would you send it to me immediately? Oh, yeah, absolutely, and of course, man, yeah, and then, you know, if, if if somebody contacts me and wants to release it, I'll send that to you, too. I'll definitely send you a copy of the tape that's coming out if you want that. Yeah, sure. Um, 
Well, basically, all I can ask is it's about um, it's about a lot of uh, the songs that are on the uh, the debut album. Yeah, sure. Ask me whatever you want. Um, what about um, Holy Wrath? Yep. That was yeah. That's just about you know the end of the world. That's about you know just about you know evil finally conquering over good and the world being destroyed. And if you take a look around these days, man, it doesn't seem like it's that far off. Things are pretty crazy these days. So, you know, it's just sort of, I guess, it's sort of uh, my reflection on the state of the world, let's put it that way. Uh, what about um, evil, evil Force? Evil Force is, believe it or not, it's actually sort of a, it's an interesting song. It's not... It's hard to describe. It, on the surface, it seems like, again, it's about, you know, the princes of hell rising up and possessing people and taking over the world, but it comes from a much deeper place than that. I sort of wrote it in that kind of way, so it wasn't too particular. It didn't, didn't, you know, it was sort of a metaphor for something else, something very personal to me, let's put it that way. Uh, what about... Uh... Kill the King is a rainbow cover, and, you know... Rainbow, like I said, you know, Mike Keller's Rainbow, but no, Rainbow is one, of, probably my favorite band of all time. And we, you know, when, when we did the album, it was like two months after Ronnie James Dio had died, so you know, we just felt that we should give him a tribute, you know. Uh, I was, uh, I was about to, I was about to uh, to say that Kill the King was. Uh, I had to say it was a good, it was a good cover to Rainbow. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, nah, yeah, like I said, favorite band, I love them. And, yeah, thank you, I appreciate that, I'm glad you like it. You're welcome. Like, always in covers, you cannot really, uh, top the, top the original. Like I, uh, like I said in, uh, Peter's interview, like, that they, they did, uh, the cover of Born to Be Wild, you cannot top the covers, but they say that they're not, that they don't want to, to better anybody, they just want to pay a tribute to it. Exactly. That's the same thing with me. I ain't trying to outdo anybody or top anybody. And, you know, Sacrificial Blood's a uh, completely, almost completely different style of music from Rainbow, so I don't even really think you can compare them, you know. But, yeah, no, we're not trying to one-up anybody. They're just a favorite band, and like I said, you know, we love Dio. We like every band Dio's ever been in, so, you know, we're going to pay a tribute to him, you know. Uh, well, I guess basically I just answered... All of my, all of my uh, questions. Yeah, right on. 